Hello and welcome to uh, Books in the World. And I'm your host, Dave Surratt. And, my, and the book we'll be talking about today is Born Bridge. And we have poet Alice Kochimba as my guest. And I'll tell you a little, bu- a little bit about Alice, and then we're going to have her, her read a poem. So Alice is the author of a chapbook, uh, Death of, a, of the Tea Tucket Hardware and Born Bridge. Um, she's the founding director of Calliope. Calliope. I have trouble with that word all the time. Poetry series at the uh, West Falmouth Library. And in 2009, she facilitated a poetry discussion group at the Falmouth Public Library. Uh, she's been published in many publications, and I've known her um, as a friend and as a, a fellow workshop, workshop poet, and I'm thrilled to have her. So if you could read us a poem and okay. start us off. All right. Well, I think what I'll do is I'll read Death of Tea Ticket Hardware. Um, if I had to say, that if there was just one poem that people would remember, this would be the one. Death of Tea Ticket Hardware. I never knew his name, nor he mine. He was always there, patient, polite, shy. I never knew the name of what I needed either, but he did after listening. You know that thingamajig that connects the hose to the washer? I need the innards of a lamp. He'd find it in a flash through overcrowded aisles so narrow only a munchkin could maneuver. In the back of the store on the dusty top shelf where what's it slip? And he'd tell me how to use it, and he'd tell me again, drawing it on that little scratch pad he kept at the register, not the electric kind, next to the dish of pennies and the bowl of lollipops. I would always leave with a red one and confidence. He was the kindest man in town. I imagined he went home at 5.30 every night to the apartment above the store and told his wife over meatloaf and mashed potatoes, green beans and pecan pie. That lady came in again today, seems bright enough, but doesn't even know a lamp has a socket. And he'd smile when she would say, oh, Mrs. Dimwit, and they would turn on the news at six. The drive to town is eerie now, the tea ticket hardware is gone. Boarded up windows stare like a zombie whose soul's been stolen by Walmart. Peter Cabral, son of John, son of Peter, son of John. I never said hello or goodbye or thank you. Oh, that's so great. That's so beautiful. Nice. (laughs) <laughs> Nicely done. I, I, I'm always interested when you ask a poet to read a poem, one poem, um, why they pick that poem, what, they, what that poem tells us about you as a poet. Why, why is it that poem? Why is it that poem? Um, well, I don't know if poets are noted for their humor, but I love the self-deprecating part that you could call, I can call myself Mrs. Dimwit, <laughs> which is actually true when it comes to anything mechanical. When I was a kid and you'd have those uh, psychological tests, I used to test in the 10th percentile on a mechanical ability. So once I knew that, I sort of gave up ever thinking I could fix anything, but I know how to ask the right people. Nice. Yeah, I think think when you choose a poem, the one poem, um, you want to choose the poem that welcomes people in. And I think that that poem welcomes you in with the humor and, and, you know, and uh, especially the self-effacing humor. Um, so I, I'm interested in how things were made, just like the hardware store. Um, so I was looking at Bornbridge, again, rereading it the, uh, the other night, and I've noticed you broke it into three parts. Uh-huh. And I tried you know, to see what I think the parts mean, but I'd, I'd like to know why you, what the three parts are and why, why you broke them into them. Uh, well, actually, um when I wrote the book, I didn't write it as a book over years. I just was writing just for the sheer pleasure of it. And when I tried to organize it into um, a, a book that you could read from cover to cover, um, the three parts are called Marrow, which is really the poems of childhood and the poems of where I come from, which is Jamaica Plain, um, a working class uh, neighborhood in Boston. The middle part um, is called Stone. And I would say that's the darker part of the manuscript. And um, my career is, has been as a psychotherapist. So it sort of 
plums the dreams of people and their tragedies. And of course, the manuscript has to go up uh, towards the hopeful part. And um, I live in Falmouth, and the last part um, is called Marsh because I built a house that was overlooking a marsh. Nice. And, and, and uh, that's exactly how I felt about it. How, did you f how do you feel that uh, Jamaica, growing up in Jamaica Plain, in, in that kind of neighborhood, how, how does that speak to your poems? Well, um, it, it, one of the things that is true um, is that I, I always say I don't have a great imagination, but um, I write from my experience. So if you look at, um, you know, Zero Newbury Street was this really upscale um, store on Zero Newbury Street. And from where I grew up, you could take the trolley into work. I worked there as a 16-year-old. But it was like crossing from one world to another by class. And uh, that, that particular poem is about really meeting uh, Judy Garland, like on Christmas Eve, who had bought nine pairs of shoes. And I can still remember that the amount of money she spent on shoes was probably more than my father took home in probably two, a two-week paycheck. And so I was always sort of captivated by, in Boston, all the neighborhoods are relatively close. And if you cross from one to another, how you crossed one, from one world to another. That's great. Because uh, I was thinking, too, because uh, uh, I grew up in a similar background, is that we like the names of things. And I love how you name your people, you name your places. I'm always, I, I, I always find that very comforting, because then you can place, put your your people in your places next to that. Um, so in the second part, um, the sadder poems. Now, do they, how did, do you bring what you were as a professional to the sadder poems? Do you ask, do you ask your poems the same questions you would ask somebody uh, you were helping? Um, yes. What's the question? Tell um, me again, you told me. Uh, well, you know, how so? How so? Yeah. How so? In what way? <laughs> Tell me more about that. Yes. So the specificity, you say naming things. People can say words like grief, but if you don't really know how to describe it, what it feels like or sounds like, um, or, you know, I'm frustrated, that's a great word, but, you know, what exactly is bothering you? So uh, you... We, we were talking before we came on uh, about the Angelus, which again was something that happened every day at noon. The church bells went off and as kids, we would just stop and say the Angelus, which you know these days might seem really odd, but in that time in the f late 50s, early 60s, it wasn't that strange. And it was right around the time that JFK was assassinated and um, you know, growing up in Irish Catholic Boston, that was like, maybe like what 9-11 was for us now. That was a day that the wor world stood still. So that, that poem really is very specific and it is dark in its own way. When I, when I teach, I always, um, I always want to help kids uh, to get started to, to tell them what works in a poem. And you just did two really wonderful things. The first thing is, um, about naming places and naming things, but tell me the three th questions again, because th that's like every poem you've ever uh, you could write. Uh, Say them again, please. Uh, how so? Yeah. In what way? And tell me more about that. Which is every poem. That's so wonderful. That should be the name of the book you write for <laughs> teaching us how to write poetry. Uh, and so finally we get to uh, the last section, and um, Marsh. So, and I, I know that... Uh, when I um, do uh, new bios, I love writing. He lives on Cape Cod, and there's something about Cape Cod and poems and poetry. So, so tell me about the marsh section. Well, um, the, this house that I built was on wetlands, and um, I sort of felt like I should write a poem um, a month that would give give back to the land since it had been so pristine, and the, then it had houses on it. Um, so that was part of it, and there still is um, poems. So there's one like Wetlands in June, which is sort of upbeat, and then there's one Wetlands in November, which is about what happens when things go, go um, 
well, I won't say dark, but they, they go under the surface. So um, I think, well, this is sort of the secret in a lot of these poems. I really have an ambivalent relationship with Cape Cod. <laughs> I feel more like a city dweller still, and I love going over the bridge. I mean, I think there's a reason why it's called Bourne Bridge. There's a lot of people will say, oh, you went over the bridge, or we were saying, you know, you come all the way from Falmouth. And I'm like, well, it's only 40 minutes away. <laughs> but for me, writing these poems was a way of saying, I live here now, which was not um, an easy decision. Oh, that's great. Um, let's, um, you, you mentioned something else I was going to talk about, and you just mentioned it. Uh, but the whole Catholicism, uh, I think, uh, especially the traditions we grew up, uh, give you lots of things to write about. So if you could talk a little bit about how growing up in that culture, how that affects, not, I mean, you, uh, it affects you, but the poem is more importantly. Um, well, uh, you know, it's full of metaphor. Um, and the, the poems that I wrote, I would say that the, the central thing that pulled it together, because they're not about the church itself, it was really about the way it defined a community, that people knew each other, uh, it was tight-knit, and the biggest issue was my when I was 10, my father died, and so my childhood sort of abruptly ended, and so to me there's a before and an after, and um, and, all, and also in my work as a psychotherapist, I was somebody that uh, saw a lot of um, victims of the church's sexual abuse scandal. So, you know, it was always in my mind, like, how do you look at what was good and yet be really honest and direct about what was really, you know, uh, horrible crimes against children? So I think that there, there, there is one in the book um, that isn't about anybody in particular that I ever saw, but there's this quote, well, it's a little quote from the Bible where it, it's about um, what would, would, one of the places that Jesus is really angry if anybody ch harms a child, it's better a millstone would be thrown around the neck and drowned. And so I think that the poetry gave me a way uh, to really take an experience and try to really plumb it and figure out what was good that we should keep, and what really was something that should never have been al allowed. And, when, and what makes it sort of a place you can forever search is, I, I don't know where that line is, you know. I think that so, so much poetry is finding that line between the before and the after, and the beginnings and the endings, and what's good about something and what's bad about something. So I think you'll have, you know, have plenty <laughs> to write about. Um, but it's like a circle, because what really was I mean, I think people are still searching for meaning. I mean, I think I, you know, my my son said to me as a psychotherapist, he said, you're really a secular priest. Yeah. That people don't go to confession, they go to right. talk to a therapist. Right, no, absolutely. Uh, let's talk about you as a poet. Uh, I read just a little bit of, of why you became a poet. But if you can tell us, that it's in the back of your book, that, you know, what, when did you start writing poetry? Um, when did you say, you know, I'm a poet. I'm do, I do this now. Uh, I still have a hard time saying I'm a, I'm a poet. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll say I write poetry. Right. I don't say I. I will say I am a therapist. I don't say I am a poet. Um, I'll I, say it. You are a poet. Thank you. <laughs> I think, <laughs> but I am. Um, how I got into poetry at all? I I would say that like many people, I had no interest in poetry. It seemed like one of the most impractical things in the world. <laughs> and I was uh, pouring uh, lemonade for my son's Little League team, and I was hit by a line drive. Uh, oh and I lost the ability to read, so I ended up with a seizure disorder. Um, and the only thing that could get me to, to relearn how to read was reading Emily Dickinson. Wow. So, you know, years later really I started to write because of that experience of losing the most pleasurable thing was the ability to read um, and then to come back into it with people who have to say a lot with very few words. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. So that's a pretty amazing story. Uh, see I think it's a lost opportunity teaching children that they don't 
teach poetry. That I, 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 especially kids who are afraid of, of, of language and these books full of words, that here's just this little piece. Yeah. Take this little piece and it'll just shine a little light for you. So that's pretty wonderful. Um, you're also working on an anthology for Cape Cod, which I, th I wanted to make sure I, I, we talked about. Um, yes. Your new home. My but new you don't home. mind leaving. <laughs> and, or coming <laughs> or back. Or coming back. Um, Your birth both ways. Yeah. Well, it, um, Calliope Poetry is now in partnership with Bass River Press, which is the imprint of the Cultural Center of Cape Cod, so just down the street here. And we are going to um, do a, a poetry anthology that celebrates Cape Cod as a region. So it will be called um, From the Father Shore, Discovering Cape Cod and the Islands Through Poetry. It will be released in 2020, and it will have the sort of iconic Cape poets, uh, we hope, in it, from Stanley Kunitz uh, and uh, Mary Oliver and Mark Doty and Brendan Galvin and and then it will also be for people who just came here once and fell in love with the Cape. And uh, the submission period is open until June 30th, and all the um, information is on the Cultural Center of Cape Cod's website under the Bass River Press. But we're really excited to find poems that actually are not your generic, I walk this beach poem, and I'm thinking this thought, but could you, could you could we celebrate what makes the Cape unique, diverse, and and capture its spirit? That's great. So, um, so if you have a poem, <laughs> that's if right. You have a poem, submit it, send it in. Uh, another thing I'm always interested in when meeting a poet is uh, why they became a poet. I always love those stories, but um, what keeps them writing in, that, in, that, in two different ways? Uh, what inspires you still? But how do you um, how do you keep working at it? How do you keep sitting down and actually doing the work? Are there writing habits that, you know, maybe, you know, I could steal? Okay. Uh, well, there, there are two parts of this, I think. One is I've had the pleasure since, for the last 10 years, of running a poetry discussion group at the Falmouth Public Library. We meet monthly and we read a poet a month. And so, you, when you really immerse yourself in reading, you know, it's like a minor poets borrow, but major poets steal. Like right. you can see the way. And I, I can't write like Charles Wright or like Mark Doty. They have a, but they have a beauty to it. And I think it's somehow you absorb it a little bit. So certainly reading poetry uh, and having a group of people that you can just, I mean, you just read the poems out loud and say what moves you. That has really kept me going. And every morning, um, you know, as a psychotherapist, you have a 50-minute hour. So every morning with my first cup of tea, um, I will read a poem, uh, and then I will just do a free write as a meditation. And um, that poem that I had read, Death of Tea Ticket Hardware, came from that experience of reading maybe for a week the same poem. One of my all-time favorites is Naomi Shihab Nye, Palestinian American poet who wrote Kindness and the first part of that poem goes before you know what kindness really is you must lose things and I started thinking and Death of Tea Ticket Hardware came in a whole piece which is very unusual for me um, mostly you know you get a little something and then you know you throw it out or you put it aside and it probably takes me 50 drafts to get to a working draft Wow. And we, we know each other from a, a very small workshop. And then once a month, you have a group of people that are, are both kind and honest. And they can help you see what needs to be sort of weeded out and what needs to be developed. Um, and you just saw, in, by, by talking about other poets, um, I know this is a question most poets get asked. But not just what poets inspire you. Um, but like two parts of it. What poets you know inspired you early on? What poets inspire you now? And um, and is there any value of, of being and seeing and hearing like living poets uh, for your oh. own writing? Oh, of course. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, the early on, I would say it would be um, William Stafford, uh -huh. and um, 
Mary Oliver, um, both because they were sort of plain spoken and I didn't feel like I needed to remember Greek mythology and figure out what the form was that they were writing. They're free verse and they, they, it was conversational. And with, even with William Stafford, like uh, oftentimes he'll start a poem like, anyway. Yeah, or, that's right. And, and you, you feel like you've, you're eavesdropping, which is a, a great pleasure. And um, how we actually first got to know each other, I came up to the series you ran at the East Bridgewater Library. And having read, uh, run Calliope for almost 10 years, I could hear all these wonderful poets that I never would have time to read, and you would hear them. And some people um, had a more elegant language than I do. And I can't say I would write like that, then I'll just tell you another little uh, joke. I took a, a workshop with Mark Doty at Castle Hill a couple of years ago, and um, he's a wonderful person, a wonderful teacher. And I s said, um, I tried to write a, a poem in, in your style. And I took it to my poetry group, and they crossed off all the adverbs and adjectives. And I came out, and I said, I guess I'm no Mark Doty. And he just smiled and said, I wish I could say that. <laughs> And I love the humility when people actually are secure inside, they actually welcome you into the poetry community. And when they are more ego driven, uh, there's a lot of elbowing to get ahead. <laughs> it's a small prize so, <laughs> in a small space. So, no, I find that this. So, um, what poets have you heard, if, uh, like actually heard, read that you just. Just where those, you know, just inspired you. That you mentioned Mark Doty, but are there others that you sure. just? And I, well, I think you know I've done a lot with mass poetry. Yes. Um, Ocean Vuong, a Vietnamese poet. Uh. If you could hear him read, I, I think he's reading in Cambridge uh, pretty soon. Um, it's mesmerizing. Um, I've I've gotten to hear um, Philip Levine before he died. Uh, again, you know, the working class story, which just feels so like it needs to be said, especially in this, I hate to say, political time where things are so divided, that we need to find ways to bring people together, whether it's the, the immigrant experience or the, or the sort of people who really are on the margin economically. Um. I don't know if that answered your question, by the way. <laughs> it, no, it did. It did because I, 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 I used to tell my students that that there are such great writers and great voices, and they're ten minutes away, they're twenty minutes away. Yeah. And uh, sometimes it seems they think it's it's a whole other world. Uh, not just my students, but just other people. It, and as you open the newspaper in, uh, in anywhere in New England, you can find a wonderful writer reading somewhere, and uh, and and find your inspiration for and, months. And you might not know their name, but if you just put yourself in that space of, let me be um, surprised, let me be engaged, you'll find somebody anywhere, and including the open mics, where people oh, just so have one you know, poem. Uh, and sometimes you just feel like, oh, this person that you might walk by at Staples or at Stop and Shop, they're actually a poet, and you would never know who they are. Now. When you, when I know that uh, I've heard you read, when you, when do you reach a point when you're writing that you have to read it out loud to see what it sounds like to you? And does it change when you read it in front of people? Absolutely, absolutely. In fact, I would say there is no such thing as a poem that gets finished. Sometimes you, you know, you abandon them. But when you feel like you've got something pretty well set, not, not like fresh paint that you've just done, because uh, there's actually people who you're asking for three minutes of their life that they're never going to get back. <laughs> then you go to, at least I would go to an, uh, uh, a series that had an open mic, and I could hear a tiny thud. Somebody would all of a sudden be totally engaged, and then they'd fall out of the poem. And then I would say, oh, I really need to work on this. Yeah, no, I know I'm not, when I do an open mic, like I'm scribbling things out as I do it, and the same thing. It's almost like you hit a bad note. Yeah. It's, it's a lot like singing, um, so that's pretty great. Um, I'd like to hear another poem. I think I always think that no matter what we talk about, the, the best advertisement for someone's poems and for poetry is, is to have someone read one. 
So if you'd read another poem, that would be wonderful. Okay, this is where <laughs> I always have to say it's either um, Born Bridge, which is the title poem, or else it'll be a new poem, just to try it out. Well, we, we might have time for both, so. All right, well, let me try a new poem. Okay. And this is uh, um, the other project I'm working on in addition to a, the anthology <clears throat> is um, a chapbook, which is 13 poems, all that have the word thank you. Okay. So if it's all right, I will... <clears throat> This one was written, if anybody remembers, last March. Um, we had two or three nor'easters, oh, and yes. we, we certainly lost power. I'm sure a lot of people did. <clears throat> so this is called Thank You. Thank you for this splatter of sunlight after weeks of gray and how it illuminates more than these French tulips spilling over a blue vase and for the failure of a late March nor'easter to dump another foot of snow, and for these pines steadfast in a tumultuous wind, like our politicians are supposed to be, and for this nuthatch at the theater, eating as if practicing yoga, and for just this, ginger peach tea in this misshapen mug that wobbles but holds steady and does what it is supposed to do. Nice. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah, I think we have time. It'd be nice we can close with and we'll with Bourne Ridge and it'll be a nice little uh, frame for the for our, our talk. And thank Great. you so much for oh, being here. It's delighted, thank you. Okay. And ju just to say that this um, an artist on Martha's Vineyard, uh, Genevieve Jacobs, did the cover for Bourne Bridge. Born Bridge. Not the hard rain the rivers crave, not the downpour to quench the forest floor, just a light mist on almost empty roads. As I'm entombed in gray, the only sound an intermittent shush, wipers clearing windshield. This quiet is pleasing, a monochromatic alone when suddenly the overcast lightens from charcoal to dove, then splits into strands of mauve salmon rose, and the bridge ahead luminous, wrapped in a pale blue shawl. Each raindrop clings, glistening in pure light that's al always there, even when hidden. Beautiful. I've come home. Beautiful. Thank you very much. And I think we, I think, um, tell people to get out there, write their poems, and that's come right. find us. That's right. So thank you. Thank you for, for listening. Thank you for, um, for being my guest, and, and we'll hope to see you soon. Absolutely. <laughs>